On Monday, we're going to have a panel discussion at St. Mark Presbyterian Church in Newport Beach, which is 2200 San Joaquin Hills, uh, Newport Beach, the corner of uh, MacArthur Boulevard. This coming uh, Monday, February 9th, from 7 p.m. until 8.30 p.m. 7 p.m. until 8.30 Monday night at St. Mark Presbyterian Church in Newport Beach, inshallah. I'm going to be at the panel with other uh, Muslim leaders, inshallah. Surat, we concluded, alhamdulillah, Surat Al-A'raf, and now we go to Surat Yunus, alayhi salam, which is Surah number 10 in the Holy Quran, this chapter, Yunus, or Jonah, is chapter number 10. And Yunus is one of the prophets who descends from the Bani Israel, the children of Israel. And he lived in northern Iraq in the city of Mosul, which is occupied by ISIS today. The ancient name of Mosul is Nainawa. So his ministry and his work and his preaching was at that city. City of Nainawa is one of the very ancient, ancient cities in, in the Middle East. And his other nickname in the Quran وَذَنُّونِ إِذْ ذَهَبَ مُغَاضِبًا فَظَنَّ أَلَّا نَقْدِرَ عَلَيْهِ ذُنُّونَ This is his nickname, but his name is Yunus or Jonah. So his chapter has 109 verses or ayat, and maybe we're going to spend about two years reflecting on this chapter, Surah Yunus. بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على سيدنا ونبينا وحبيب قلوبنا أبي القاسم المصطفى محمد وعلى أهل بيته الطيبين الطاهرين المعصومين الذين أذهب الله عنهم الرجس وطهرهم تطهيرا أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم ألف لام را تلك آيات الكتاب الحكيم أكان للناس عجبا أن أوحينا إلى رجل منهم أن أوحينا إلى رجل منهم أن أنذر الناس أن أنذر الناس وبشر الذين آمنوا أن لهم قدم صدق عند ربهم أن لهم قدم صدق عند ربهم بهم قال الكافرون إن هذا إن هذا لساحر مبين صدق الله العلي العظيم This chapter begins with the abbreviated letters. And about 29 chapters in the Quran begins with these abbreviated letters. The very first one in Surah Al-Baqarah, Alif Lam, 
Meem. In this chapter, Surah Yunus, Alif, Lam, Ra. And there is a whole discussion surrounding the nature of these abbre uh, abbreviations. Why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uses these letters? Couldn't he begin with a sentence or a term or a word or a name rather than these appreciations that makes no sense to many people? Yes, it does not make sense to us, but it does make sense to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And also to the Imams who inherited the knowledge of the Prophet. And Allah says this in the Holy Book, in the Quran. Some of the secrets of this book, which is ta'wil. Ta'wil is the esoteric meaning, the hidden meaning. Quran has two parts. One is muhkam. The verse that you read, and if you are, you, you master the Arabic grammar and Arabic literature and Arabic language, you understand the meaning. But then there are the other part of it, which is mutashabih, which is not muhkam. It's not apparent. It's not clear. Even if you understand good Arabic, you don't understand the meaning. You need someone to guide you, to walk you through the meaning. And those who walk you through this meaning are none but the Prophet وسلم, and the Imams, his household, his family who bequeathed the knowledge from the Prophet. So those people, they know the meaning of these abbreviated letters. We don't know the meaning of them. For us, some people believe that they are mystic symbols in the Quran. I read an interesting commentary on these uh, uh, abbreviated letters in the Quran. One of them says that Allah begins in 29 chapters with these letters, Kaf, Ha, Ya, Ain, Saad, Alif, Lam, Mim, Alif, Lam, Ra, and others, to tell the people that this book that no one could rival if the entire mankind with the help of the jinn they congregate ishtama'at congregate they have a conference to bring something a chapter and we have sometimes the chapter is only three verses Three verses. They cannot bring something like it. Not even a single verse in the Quran. And they tried, they tried. And the Arabs in the Arabian Peninsula, if they had nothing, they were completely bankrupt. They had only one thing, which is Arabic literature and Arabic poetry and Arabic prose. They had the command of the language. An ordinary person who walks in the desert and he has no education, zero education. But when he sees something, he can immediately he can create some poetry. When he describes something, he can create some powerful poetry that even today we can't make it. Sometimes we can't even understand it. They had this ability. Allah challenged them with this with this book, that see this book is made of these simple letters. We are not bringing Roman letters or Greek letters or other language. It is the same Arabic alphabet. The Quran is made from the same Arabic alphabet, very simple letters, but you cannot bring something similar to it. This is one of the meanings, one of the reasons that Allah Brings, uh, begins some of the chapters with these abbreviated letters Alif, Lam, Mim, Alif, Lam, Alif, Lam, Ra, and others. One of the scholars, Alama Tabatabai, 
Rahmatullahi alayhi. He says that he gives this example, this parable, parable. He says in the same fashion that God created everything from what? Huh? All the creatures are made of what? The clay, the clay. Teen, the birds, animals, not only humans, even birds and animals are made of the clay. So our origin is the dirt, is the dirt. And from this dirt, you can make, create simple things. Kids, they can go on the beach and they create a, a sand castle out of this sand or dirt. And Allah can create this complex human brain and a human being out of the same dirt, not something else. Not a different substance, the same substance. The same thing with the Quran. The Quran is made of these letters, no more, no less. But look at the creation of God, the wonders of God. He created the Quran from the same language that the Arabs, the Arabs use daily in their conversation, in their life. But when it comes to creating something to rival the Quran, to be similar to the Quran, they are unable. This is one of the meanings of these abbreviated letters in the beginning of these chapters. Alif Lam Ra. Tilk ayatul kitab al mubin. And tilk in the Arabic literature we have asma'ul ishara. When you are pointing at something, you say hada, dhak, tilk. The farther you go, you use tilk or dhak, dhalik, while when something is close to you, you say hadha, hadha, hadihi, when they are close. The Quran is using the term tilka ayatul kitab al mubin for something which is too far, while the Quran is in your hand, very close to your eyes. Allah says, yes, physically close to your eyes, but the meaning is too sublime and too lofty and too great. And you need to reflect, you need to refine yourself and refine your mind in order for you to understand what I am telling you. Allah says, you need to refine. Not any soul is prepared to understand the verses of the Quran. This book sometimes becomes boring for those who don't understand it. But on the other hand, it becomes an enjoyment. Enjoyment spiritual entertainment for those who do understand it, for those who do reflect on it. Tilka ayatul kitab al-hakim. The book that has been described as hakim. And hakim comes from hikmah. And hikmah is interpreted in English to, to wisdom, wise or wisdom, hakim. Tilka ayatul kitab al hakim. Let me s s see what this gentleman says here about hakim. He says, Book of Wisdom. What is wisdom? Scholars they say, Al, -wis uh, al hikmah, wisdom, ta'ni al ilmu wal mantiqu wal istidlal. When we say someone is hakim, he has some wisdom. Or this book is the book of wisdom. Wisdom here means using his logic, his knowledge, his logic, and istidlal, deduction. This is the meaning of wisdom. Now, what does it mean when Allah becomes wise? One of his names, one of the attributes of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Hakim. Allah is Hakim. Al-Raghib al-Isfahani, one of the most powerful and prominent and able linguistics of the Arabic literature who's, who was not Arab. Al-Raghib al-Isfahani. And by the way, it's not Isfahan. The ancient name is Isbahan. Isbahan, the ancient name. So when you see his name, you don't find Isfahani. Al-Raghib al-Isbahani. This man, 
He's one of the greatest linguistics or the experts of Arabic literature and Arabic language. And all Muslims, they use his books when they when they're about to, to know, when they want to know the meaning of the Qur'an, they use Mufradatul Raghib. Mufradatul Raghib. You have to have this book. I think this book has been translated also to other languages. al raghib he says in his book, Al-Hikmatu min Allah. What do we mean by saying Allah is wise? Allah is wise and Fulan is wise. So what's the difference then? What's the difference between God and him? Because we are calling both, both people, we are describing them as being hakim, wise. But there is a big difference between God, the wisdom of God, and the wisdom of man. He says the wisdom of God, al-hikmatu min Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, ijadul ashya'i ala ghayatil ihkam. Not ahkam, huh? Ihkam. Ijadul Ashya. God is, wa is wise. It means that He creates Ijad, creating things with the best type of perfection. There is nothing better than His creation. Allahu Ahsanun. The best product in the market, the best product that has no rival and no match, are the products of God. So, this is the meaning of Hikmah. When he does something, when he creates something, when he establishes something, he does it in the best shape, in the best manner. And therefore philosophers, when they come to the creation of man, they say, فَتَبَارَكَ أَحْسَنُ الْخَالِقِينَ means that if you bring all the artists, all, all the biologists, all the scientists, and tell them, create another shape, suggest a different shape for the human being. Try to put his eyes somewhere else, his nose somewhere else, his ears somewhere else, his mouth, let's say, little bit above on his forehead or here or on the side. They tell you, no, we can't. We have no options. The shape of the man today is the best shape. All his limbs, all his parts are in, in the best location. You cannot change. If you bring the best designer, he tells you, I can't. I can't come up with a different shape. So this is the meaning of his wisdom. Now, what is the wisdom of man? Al-hikmatu min al-insan. Look at how beautiful he describes that. He says, مَعْرِفَةُ الْمَوْجُودَاتُ وَفِعْلُ الْخَيْرَاتِ Two things. To recognize the world of existence, to recognize it, ma'rifa. To realize things, to understand things, to try to understand them. Any object, any object in this universe, the hakim, the wise, is the one who does understand it very well. This is one. After understanding, do we close the book and go home? No. He says, after understanding, you come to implementation. Now that you understood everything in this universe, then you have to produce, you have to do good. The good deeds, the result of good understanding is good deeds. And the result of bad understanding is what? Good deed or bad deeds? Definitely bad deeds. This is why some people do bad because they don't understand. I remember when we were little kids, the teacher used to say, always, he used to say, فَهْمُ السُّؤَالْ نَصْفُ الْجَوَابِ فَهْمِدَنِ السُّؤَالْ خُدِشْ پَنْجَهْ دَرْ سَدَزْ خُدِ جَوَاب دَادَنِ فَهْمُ السُّؤَالْ نَصْفُ الْجَوَابِ You have to understand the question first. Once you understand it, then you can answer it. Many people don't understand the question. They give the wrong answer. Especially in fiqh, by the way. Some people come to the scholar and they say, Mawlana, what do you think of this substance which is found in, in, in let's say, in cheese today? He says, haram, immediately. Wait a minute. You have to understand it. You have to say, I'm not a chemist. Let me ask a chemist to tell me what about this substance or this acid or this, you know. So we have to understand before we 
I remember one day people showed me uh, a letter coming from the office of Ayatollah Sistani regarding the prayers here in Southern California. They are asking, they asking him that here we have cities, different cities, and in each city there is a police station, there is a city hall, there is an education, whatever, department. So when we travel between these cities, do we break the prayers or we offer full prayers? For instance, you, you live in Irvine and you want to go, let's say, to Brea. So do you offer full prayers when you reach there or broken prayers? Broken means discounted prayers, qasr. The answer came that since they are different cities, then, then you have to offer broken prayers. And if you travel in the month of Ramadan, you have to break your fast because you are traveling to a different city. They showed me the paper here. I was sitting here. I said, no way. You did not explain the question very well to him. Let me go to Najaf. I'll go myself. And I went to his office and I asked, you know, someone very close to him. He said, no, they don't break the prayers. They pray full and they don't break their fast. So the one who wrote the question, he did not write it in a good way. And the one who read the question there, he has not been here to America. So he doesn't know what, what, what the situation is here. Here, yes, we have two different cities. Irvine is a city and Costa Mesa is a city. Each of them, each one of them has a, its own police department, its own probably a city council, its own health department. But does that mean you are traveling from one city into another? You're not traveling. They are suburbs, not cities. Yes, in America we call them cities. But when you translate this name, to Farsi or Arabic, they become suburbs, not cities. Cities is when you say Tehran is a city and Qom is another city. This is the meaning of city. But a neighborhood is different. A suburb is different. So, Fahmu Su'al, you have to understand the question. The Hakim, the wise person, is the one who understands things and then he he implements his understanding into practicing them. فعل الخيرات. ألف لام را. تلك آيات الكتاب الحكيم. أكان للناس عجبا. It is it a matter of wonderment to people. أكان للناس عجبا أن أوحينا إلى رجل منهم. If we reveal to one of them, if we send revelation, should they be shocked? They can't accept it? Why God sent this verse? Because the Arab mentality at that time did not have self-confidence. People who have no education, the first thing they lack and the first thing they lose is self-confidence. Someone who doesn't have education. He's not sure of his, himself, herself. They are not sure of the papers that they are signing, the contracts they are doing. They can't because they lack knowledge and they lack understanding. This is why Allah says, you have to understand. Here in America they say, do you understand this? Once you understand it, you sign. Do not sign something if you don't understand it. You have to understand. The Arabs at that time, because they lacked knowledge, and mostly they were illiterate in that society, they could not believe that God is going to choose one of them who lived among them. Though he was different. In his characters, he was different. In his faith, he was different. In his morality, he was different. But they could not take it. It was too much for them to accept that a man who used to be living among us, now he becomes God's ambassador and God's emissary and God's prophet to mankind. We can't, we can't take this because they had 
They lacked self-confidence. So they compared the Prophet to themselves. While Allah says, yes, definitely, I'm, going, I'm not going to, to send an angel. I'm going to send you a human being from among yourself. Because if we send an angel, what is wrong with sending an angel to us? Can you tell me? What is wrong? No, the human being also could be perfect. Even better than angel. Prophet Muhammad وسلم, is better than angels, definitely. No doubt about that. Why angels, malaika, farishtigan, they are not fit to be prophets and messengers. They are not fit. They are not good for this role. Why? Huh? You can't relate to them. What else? They have no feelings? No, don't say feelings. They have good feelings. But they have no desires. So, the angels, they have no needs and no desires. Meaning, the angels, they never eat. They never drink. When the angels came to Ibrahim, to his house, he brought them food. He thought, you are my guests coming from a long distance. He did not know these, these are angels. When he saw their hands does not touch the food, they stayed away. He said, what's wrong with you? Then he realized, oh, they are angels. They don't eat. They don't, they, they, they don't eat. They don't drink. They have no desires, no other desires. The only job, Allah says in the Quran, they sanctify Allah and they obey Him. They don't, they do not disobey Him, they only obey Him. So they are not fit to lead us because they don't understand us, as you said. They don't relate to us. We need someone who lives in the community. If you bring someone from outside the community, he doesn't know what he's talking about. Sometimes when they invite me to other communities, I ask them, especially for long seasons, 10 days, 20 days, I ask them on the phone two or three months before. I tell them, what are the challenges you're facing in your community? The problems that people, you know, the community, the young women, old, the youth, they suffer from. Tell me so I can prepare lectures to address these problems. I don't want to speak something alien, something that you don't relate to, something which is only history, that people are not going to benefit. A preacher should address the problems of the society and tries to find a solution. This is the job of the Prophet. This is why Allah says, I send someone from among you to live among you, to be with you, to speak the same language, to have the same desire, but at the same time he has self-control. And this is exactly what Prophet Muhammad says. Say to them, I am Bashar, human being, just like you. Mithlukum means I have desire to eat, to drink, to sleep, to rest, to have children, to have wife, to have family life. I do have desire for that. With one exception. Yuha ilay. I receive revelation and I have to, to be a role model for you. Yuha ilay. So here, those people are wondering that why God sent, why God revealed his revelation and his book and his scriptures to a man from among them. They thought that he should be an alien. He should have, have a huge size, you know. Now, do you see sometimes when other religions, they portray their prophets and their apostles and their lords. Do you see them when you go to certain temples? What shape they have? Very weird shape. When you ask them, why this has a weird shape? He says, because he's different from us. If he doesn't have a weird shape, people are not going to believe in him. So he has to be abnormal. Abnormal. 
I remember one time 40 years ago in Karbala, I was a kid. Someone came to the holy shrine and he had a turban, but this big, this big. And he was almost, he lost his balance. So I asked my father, you know, later on, why he does this? He says, because he said to my father, I want people to believe in me. If my, if my turban is small, they are not going to take me serious. <laughs> you have to show something abnormal. So people can believe, well, wow, he's, he's huge. See, look at him. This is something. So the Arabs, they could not believe that a man like Prophet Muhammad وسلم, can be the messenger of Allah. أَنْ أَوْحَيْنَا إِلَىٰ رَجُلٍ مِّنْهُمْ أَنْ أَنْذِرِ النَّاسَ وَبَشِّرِ الَّذِينَ آمَنُوا See, my friends, the revelation of the Prophet has two dimensions, two sides. One in dhar and the other is bishara. أَنْذِرِ النَّاسَ وَبَشِّرِ الَّذِينَ آمَنُوا In dhar is forewarning. The Prophet comes to the arrogant in the community there are some good people, good-natured people, and sometimes there are, unfortunately, some bad people. This is everywhere. How many of you saw the clip of burning the Jordanian pilot? Can you believe someone who says, I'm a human being? Let alone forget about being Muslim, being a Jew, being a Christian. Someone who says, I'm a human being. And he burns, he burns a man alive. Where is it? And they caught Ibn Taymiyyah. They caught him correctly. Yes, the only one who permits this type of atrocities and barbarism is Ibn Taymiyyah. The mastermind of Salafism and Wahhabism today. And I wish the American people understand who Ibn Taymiyyah is and how he is important even today in Saudi Arabia. And yesterday there was an article in the New York Times. How many of you read that article? That says this Al-Qaeda operative who is in the prison now. In his testimony back in, 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 in October in the court, he sent a letter to the judge, Zakaria Musawi, the French citizen who's, who was part of those hijackers. He said, I had, he says, the people who financed Al-Qaeda are the Saudi princes. Walid ibn Talal, Turki al-Faisal, and Bandar ibn, ibn Sultan. Those people, they paid, God knows, millions of dollars to Al-Qaeda. Millions of dollars. And he says in his letter, that he conspired, he conspired here in the Saudi embassy in Washington, D.C. He conspired with them to shoot down Air Force One. And Saudi Arabia is the strongest allies. And then we blame it on Islam. We blame all these ills on Islam. We say Muslims are bad. Maybe some Muslims are bad but some non-Muslims are even worse. Those who support them. Those who consider them to be their allies and their true friends. And they work with them and they support their regimes. So, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sent the Prophet an anzir in nas with two things. In dhar to forewarn those arrogance and those tyrants. In dhar, forewarning them of the punishment. On the other hand, those who do good, the believers, the good-spirited people, they deserve bishara, glad tidings. Qadama sitqin has three meanings where I conclude. What, what does it mean that the Prophet comes to the believers and they say to him or to them, أَنَّ لَهُمْ قَدَمَ صِدْقٍ عِنْدَ رَبِّهِمْ قَدَمَ صِدْقٍ here, this translation says, they have before their Lord the lofty rank of truth. 
But let's see what the commentators, the mufassirin, the exegists of the Quran say about qadam sidqin. Number one, qadam sidqin means Qadam in the Arabic language means sabiqa, something that happened in the past. When something happens in the past, 10 years ago, 20 years, 50 years ago, we say this is sabiqa. In the Arabic literature, they say qadam, it happened in the past, something of the past. So the Quran wants to tell them that, that Iman happened took a place with your creation. Iman was embedded in you when you were created. You were created as a believer in God. When you were created, you believed in God. Even before creation, in Surah Al-A'raf, Allah says, when the soul was ready, when the soul was created, but the body was not ready yet, before this soul, my soul and your soul, entered into the body, Allah asked me and you and everybody else, do you believe in me? Do you take me as your Lord? We said, yes, bala, we accept you. Because at that time there were no dunya, there were no attachment to dunya, to the house, to the money, to corruption, to deviation, to parties. So we were alone floating, soul. The soul, when the soul is alone, always, always poor people who are away from dunya, they believe in God. But when the dunya comes into our life, unfortunately, it takes us away from Allah. So when we were during our spiritual being, we said, yes, we believe. Now we came into this dunya, we opened our eyes. And the more we get attached to the dunya, the more we drift away from where? From God. This is why the youth, their faith is stronger because they don't know this life very much, very well. They still did not establish a business. Once they establish a business, then they say no. Dunya, akhirah is not for me, find someone else. So qadam al-sidqin here means that the Prophet reminds them of their first belief in God. He says, do you remember your first belief in God when you believed in God, your first belief? So he reminds them. In that. The second meaning of Qadam Sidqin, it is the rank, the ranking with Allah, the place with Allah. The good believers, they have a spot reserved for them next to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. They can be with him, not in distance. When we say next to him, not in distance. Al-Qurbul Maqami Lal Makani. Qurb has two meanings. Qurb has distance, proximity. No, it's not about distance. Al-Maqami, the ranking. You are close to Allah. Spiritually, you are close to him, not physically. This is the second meaning of Qadam al-Sidq. And the third one, Al-Imam. The third one, our Imams, they say Qadam al-Sidqin, that it is the Nubuwa, the prophethood of Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And the Wilaya, the leadership, the Imam, the Wilaya of Imam Amir al-Mu'mineen Alayhi Salatu Wasallam. Qadam al-Sidq. The prophethood and the imama are also referred to in the Quran as Qadam al-Sidqin. عند ربهم قال الكافرون إن هذا لساحر مبين. We will continue on this inshallah next Thursday. اللهم اغفر للمؤمنين والمؤمنات والمسلمين والمسلمات الأحياء منهم والأموات. تابع اللهم بيننا وبينهم بالخيرات إنك مجيب الدعوات إنك غافر الخطيئات Let's recite أمن يجيب المفطر Please For many of our friends In our congregation At our masjid and elsewhere Who are asking for your dua During these holy nights 
اعوذ باللہ من الشیطان الرجیم بسم اللہ الرحمن الرحیم امن یجیب المضطر اذا دعاہ اکشف السوء امن یجیب المضطر اذا دعاہ اکشف السوء امن یجیب المضطر اذا دعاہ اکشف السوء امن یجیب المضطر اذا دعاہ ویکشف السوء امن یجیب المضطر اذا دعاہ ویکشف السوء یا اللہ من على مرضانا بالشفاء والعافية المرضى المنظورين اللهم ألبسهم ثوب الصحة والعافية وإلى أرواح المؤمنين والمؤمنات فسأل قرد فوت مرحومة حاجي سعادة ياسائي مادر برادر عزيز ومن جناب آي ياسائي وسأل قرد فوت آي حبيب الله كريم وعزراء كريم پدر ومادر حاج آي علي كريم و مرحوم حاج آقای حیدر علی حیدری والد و پدر برادر عزیز من آقای حیدری الى ارواحهم و ارواح المؤمنین و المؤمنات ثواب الفاتحه مع الصلاة على محمد و آل محمد